very much for joining us today on this wonderful Tuesday morning on our We Got This Wah webinar series. Today, I'm very excited to have a conversation with Vice Admiral Bono um, as we talk about what COVID looks like for businesses as we start to reopen. Um, so I'm very excited to, to start that conversation. Before we get started, I wanted to go over just a few logistics. First of all, thank you to our event partners, Business Health Trust and the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce. If you need technical help during the webinar, please use the chat box, which is in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions for our speaker, please use the Q&A box. The Q&A box will allow us to moderate the questions easier and make sure that we get to as many as possible. And lastly, um, wanted to let everyone know that we will be recording this webinar and it will be posted on the event page at the Seattle Metropolitan Chamber of Commerce later today. Um, well, with that, I wanted to invite, invite our speaker today, um, Vice Admiral Raquel Bono uh, from the Washington State COVID-19 Health System Response Management Team. Um, love for you to turn on your video and um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I greatly appreciate your time today. Hold on, I think you are muted. Oh, perfect. Okay, there, how's that? Okay, <laughs> thank Great. you. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to join all of you today. So thank you very much for including me. Yeah, I, um, you know, as I mentioned kind of what you're doing, so you are really a critical position to ensure a coordinated effort with effective response to the COVID-19 pandemic across the state's healthcare system. Um, you know, you're working closely with the governor and executive team and a whole host of folks. I'm very excited to, to talk through. Um, so I understand that you have kind of three top priorities. One is to protect our frontline healthcare workers, to optimize um, all of Washington's health resources, and of course, keeping Washingtonians safe. Um, Thank you so much again for just talking through these priorities and um, looking at how people can start to apply this on a practical level. So with that, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And I did have some slides. I do have some slides, but what I thought I'd do is just kind of present, pivot off of what you just, how you introduced me, and then be able to share some information about what that might look like in a real practical sense as we're talking about how do we keep Washingtonians safe. So I thought I would do that and hopefully that'll invite people to ask questions or participate in the conversation in some way. And if you truly do want some slides, I can, I can put them up there and, and show you a couple of those. But um, as you said, um, the, the most important piece for me has been to always make sure that we're taking care of the frontline healthcare workers because they're right there at the interface of where they're, they're running into the disease. And to the best of our ability, when we can support and protect our healthcare workers, then we keep our healthcare system strong. The other part of keeping our healthcare system strong is making sure that we're using as much of our healthcare system as possible to get to the broadest number of people who might need it. And, and some of that is, it's a mixed, <laughs> it's kind of a mixed blessing. I think we've got such a strong healthcare system in the state of Washington, which is great but we'd also like to make sure that we're not overrunning the healthcare system. And so to that end, that goes to the third priority, which is keeping as many Washingtonians as safe as possible. So I'll start off from there, but what I will say is that there's a lot of kudos and congratulations that I'd like to give the state of Washington, because very early on, you very aggressively went into um, a restriction of movement of people on the street and in businesses and in schools and in large gatherings. And Governor Inslee's stay home, stay healthy was an important aspect of how Washington state responded to this COVID-19. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that was very notable about Washington state is that your, the, the state here started showing a bending of the curve, a flattening of the curve much sooner than anybody else in the country. And that was really a part of the leadership you have here at the state level, but also the engagement of all of the community members, whether you're in a business or you're private citizens. And I think that was reflected in how well the, the, the curve was flattened. And so that's the good news. <laughs> so we were able to actually start um, controlling some of the spread of the disease. 
And so, um, you know, and Governor Inslee kind of had to extend that stay home, stay healthy until we made sure that there were enough people that were, that didn't catch the disease, that we really had a better handle on how much disease burden or how much viral disease there was out there. Um, and so when he started his, his Safe Start program, the important part about that was we were in a better place, but it was also important to recognize that we still had very active COVID-19 going on. And, you know, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it or anything like that, but we did notice that we were starting, uh, we had, we still, I'm sorry, we still had active COVID-19 disease in long-term care facilities. And as agricultural season started, what we started noticing is that some of our, our agricultural workers were also coming down with COVID-19. And then you also observed in Eastern Washington, how we started seeing COVID disease happening in, in food processing plants. All that's to say is that we're going to have to live with COVID-19 for a while. It's not going away anytime soon. Uh, we can talk a little bit about whether or not there's a vac vaccination that's available, if there's any kind of um, effective treatment. But unfortunately, all of those solutions are going to be a long ways off because we still don't have enough evidence to show that a vaccine works and that it can be made rapidly and can be made available to a lot of different people. So if we want to help and become a part of the safe start in Washington State, we have to find a way to live safely with COVID-19. And so I think the goal for the governor in terms of, of the safe start was not to lose any of the ground if we could help it. You know, how do we make sure we don't go backwards <laughs> and start seeing more of the disease? And, and how do we make sure that we don't create new disease in new places? And so that was an important part of the discussion and the plans that the governor put in place with his, with his leadership and his cabinet is how do we safely do this without spreading disease? And so as, um, as we were looking at this, what, is, what were some of the concerns? What did we need to be mindful of? Well. We do know that the virus only spreads human to human. That's the most effective way for it to spread. We have seen that sometimes uh, it can spread if there is enough virus um, particles on an on in inanimate um, object, like on a tabletop or a chair. But oftentimes, the most effective way of spreading it is from person to person. So that was one of the things that, that we wanted to look at. How do, we, how do we minimize the spread from person to person if we're going to start relaxing some of the restrictions? The other piece that we were also concerned about is that as we, as we loosen some of the restrictions, we recognize that for some time now, people had started increasing their activity outside of the house, which is okay as long as people were able to keep from spreading the disease. Um, so what we noticed is that there was an increase in the traffic, in car traffic, but then there's also been an increase in air travel. And so that was one of the, the things that we thought, well, what, what can we do to, to help minimize that? We also knew that the holiday weekend was coming up with Memorial Day weekend and the weather of course was lovely <laughs> and it was very tempting to be able to go out there in large groups. But that was one of those things where we really had to make an effort to, to, to share with people that, that please try to avoid these very large groups. And then finally, recently, there's been a lot of, of efforts with um, marches and demonstrations where people are brought together and they're also you know, being exposed to each other. So what are some of the strategies that we talked about? Well, you've heard me mention social distancing, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about that. And I hope this is something that um, isn't too, I mean, just as a reminder. So we know from social distancing that the safe distance is actually about six to 10 feet. And why did we choose that distance? Well, we know that because this spreads human to human, the most effective way or the most um, consistent way that the virus spreads is from droplets or spray that comes out of people when they talk. So, you know, when we were younger, we'd say, you know, say it, don't spray it. Well, that's, that's one of the- back that phrase. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, so if you can think about that, what we found out is that when people talk, if they've got the, the virus, um, usually when we talk, there are droplets that come out of our mouth. And it generally, it generally falls to the ground at two and a half feet. 
But we know that some people, especially if they're talking very loudly or if they're shouting, sometimes the spray of their saliva actually can reach up to 10 feet if they're very loud talkers or if they are really forcefully talking. So six feet is generally where we know that if people are spraying it, that that's as far as it'll, it'll go. So social distancing means keeping out of the the way of, of people who are talking really loudly, and this is a good hint for all of us too, is that we, we want to be mindful of how our voices are modulated because the more we can modulate our voice, the lower we can decrease the spray in our, our um, saliva. Um, the other piece is, is that we've talked about frequent hand washing, and so that is one of the areas where the virus can sit, get on your hands, and if you touch your face, it can go into your nose, into your eyes, and into your mouth inadvertently. And so having a lot of um, hand washing stations or hand sanitizers, sanit hand, sorry, hand sanitizer, sanitizers readily available goes a long way to helping eliminate or decrease the number of viral particles on people's hands. Um, um, and we've always known, and, and it's coming out even more vividly here, is that when you're not feeling well, you, you know, you, you really got to stay home. Because just as I was explaining with, you know, saying it, not spraying it, if you're ill, usually what that means is in your droplets from your saliva or when you're talking, those droplets have carry actually even more virus par viral particles. And the more viral particles uh, that you have, that are coming out, um, the, the more likely you are to infect somebody. And then finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about masks and why they're so important. And, and masks have become kind of a, an interesting statement, but um, as a surgeon, you know, when I wore masks in the operating room, the real reason that I was wearing a mask in the operating room was not so much that I was afraid that whatever I was operating on was going to infect me. It was just that I know, I, I knew that I was, as I was operating, that the mask prevented some of the, the germs or the particles of, of my own saliva from going into the wound. So a mask is there to kind of protect people from it going out as well as from receiving it. And the proper way of wearing a mask is over the nose and the mouth. So sometimes you see some of these more fashionable mask wearing <laughs> um, configurations where people have it like beneath their nose and that doesn't work very well or they're actually wearing it under their chin. And I have <laughs> run into a couple of people who have worn masks kind of like a hat <laughs> and that does nothing to help with that. So I think it, it, you know, the masks uh, help us in terms of controlling some of the exchange of virus particles or even germs if you have another type of, of infection. And, um, and, and I think the piece that we want to make sure about wearing masks is that people understand that it's not a substitute. It's not a substitute for social distancing. It's not a substitute for hand washing or staying home when you're sick. It's something that is helpful if you can't keep the social distance and you, you might need to be in close quarters. Like when you go into the supermarket or when you're shopping or when you know you're going to be talking to people who are not from your same household and you can't easily talk to them across six feet then you wanna make sure that you're wearing a mask. So how does this apply to some of the businesses? Uh, there's a lot of, of guidance and suggestions that are coming out from the CDC as well as from the Department of Health here in Washington State. And so like for restaurants or businesses, we're asking that you maintain uh, the six feet distance between people to the extent that you can. Uh, many shopping centers, grocery stores have very conveniently marked the six feet distance so that when you're going through the checkout line, you don't crowd the person in front of you. People have been putting up plexiglass uh, at the cashiers or different stations when you can't maintain that six feet distance. Um, and then uh, making sure that you've got hand sanitizers and other hand washing stations in different areas around, around your, uh, your business. Uh, a couple of other things that I've seen, and I think that this is also a great idea, is moving towards having automatic door openers because we do know those are one of the areas where germs and viruses can collect and they can go from person to person. And then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, I'll stop with this one last idea and then see if there are any comments or questions. Um, 
Because part of our ability to successfully live with COVID-19 is going to be based on how well we can continue to test people and see where the disease is going. One of the things that I've offered or I've, I've put out there for people to consider is whether or not businesses could help with finding ways to either support or, um, or um, um, promote testing and, and being able to help work with either the health system or public health to promote that kind of surveillance and contact tracing. And we wanna make this as easy as possible, but we do know that if somebody is infected, their ability to infect others is so almost scarily easy. Mm -hmm. and, and if we have a way of identifying very early on that someone had the potential or was potentially exposed to the virus, then we know that if we isolate them early, then it really does a great job of preventing spread. And, and just to give you an idea of how quickly this virus can spread is that we know that if one person gets infected, that by the time there are 11 transmissions of this virus, that you can get up to 77,000 people being infected. And it's at the 11th, I'm sorry, at the 12th transmission of it that you're now starting to impact 156,000 people. And that's why the isolation and early identification is so important. So I'll stop there and see if there are any kind of questions or, uh, or if you have some additional recommendations that I can incorporate into some of my own talking points down the road. Uh, but I'd be very interested to hear what, um, what some of our listeners have to say. So thank you for that, those few minutes. Yes. Um, so I do have a question just to, to kick us off. You were talking um, just about testing capacity and tracing capacity. When can we expect that the testing capacity will grow? And what are some of the things that, you know, those listening today might be able to help with kind of from a practical standpoint and um, yeah. rallying the business community? Yeah, that's a great question because part of the challenge that we've had with the coronavirus this entire time has been the availability of PPE, the personal protective equipment. And usually what that means are the gloves, the gowns and, and masks. Um, and, and that's important because the testing itself has to be done by a person who is wearing PPE. And so if we're low on PPE, then that's going to really limit how well we can do the testing. The other thing that's been challenging with testing is actually having enough supplies, the nasal swabs, the nasopharyngeal swabs available. So we've been able to turn on some of the manufacturing here locally. Uh, across the country, there have been other companies that have started manufacturing the nasopharyngeal swabs, and we've been able to get some of the distribution. But that's a really great point that uh, we continue to have challenges with being able to do testing in a broad enough way. Fortunately, the state has been working both with the federal government and private industry to get shipments of the nasopharyngeal swabs. And the areas that we're looking at is working with the healthcare community, uh, with the local health jurisdictions. And one of the things that we'll hopefully explore here is can we broaden the testing to other areas like pharmacies or uh, urgent care centers. So those are some of the areas that, that we're going to be looking at. But this would be something where some of the businesses being able to partner with either um, uh, urgent care centers or even some of the health plans mm -hmm. to make testing more broadly available would be a big help especially as we're able to collect that information in a, a centralized database and be able to know just how many people are being impacted and what the potential is for spread. So you spoke a little bit about the protests that are occurring and how that fits into, you know, where we go from here as, you know, a county, a state, um, and even, you know, beyond that. Given that, you know, protests are still happening and people are in close proximity, what are some of the plans that you guys have been thinking about or things you've been talking about to help reduce a second spike in the virus? Yeah, great question. And, and we've been advising people that when participating in, um, in the protests or the demonstrations or the marches uh, to continue wearing masks. Uh, it, it doesn't seem that the social distancing piece is, is uh, you know, and part of a, a march is having a lot of people show their collective, you know, their collective feelings on that. So, um, so there's a lot of proximity there and uh, being able 
to wear masks when you're in the march and then practice good hand hygiene and having hand, sanit hand sanitizer readily available. Also make sure that you're not sharing things when you're in a march like your water or your, your phones or you know, try not to pass objects from one another. Uh, so those are areas that we've been continuing to advise people to do and be mindful of. And I actually, I have known of some of the marches where part of the support that they've received have been uh, providing masks, cloth masks, mm -hmm. and hand sanitizers, which I think is, is really very helpful because um, you're trying to be able to get uh, the maximum benefit from being in those, in those close quarters. Yeah, I, the last few, you know, week or so, I've been thinking a lot about the masks in that, mm -hmm. that capacity. Um, it'll be very interesting to see, you know, what, what numbers really are coming out and um, to really help support the role yeah. of masks and to really see, you know, okay, if, if people are in close proximity, really, how did that help? You know, did it spike? Did it, were we flat? Were we able yeah. to continue that even though there wasn't as much social distancing going on? So um, it'll, kind of a social experiment in a very bad way, <laughs> but um, you know, as we look for more data on how to protect ourselves, and as you said at the beginning, to live with COVID, right? Actually right. live our lives and figure out what that new normal is, um, that'll be super important. Um, yeah. So I'm sure you know, the World Health Organ Organization came out yesterday with um, a statement about asymptomatic carriers. Um, could you talk a little bit about your perspective on on that, on their statement. Yeah. Um, I think they've walked it back today yeah. a little bit, but, but talk to us about that from um, you know, your perspective. Yeah, so, um, well, first off, I was glad to hear WHO kind of walk that back because what we had been observing in real time is that we were uncovering or we were identifying people who were spreading the virus when they didn't have symptoms of their own. And at the time we were thinking, were they, were they pre-symptomatic? Was this before they actually developed the symptoms themselves or were they truly asymptomatic? Well, in some cases we know that there are people who have the virus but don't necessarily um, demonstrate an infection or they have very minor symptoms um, and they may not even feel ill. So uh, we've recognized for some time now that that people were able to spread the disease to other people, even if they didn't have the full blown symptoms of that. So we were always taking um, the abundance of caution that if somebody had been exposed to uh, somebody who was a known COVID positive person um, and they still um, hadn't developed any of the symptoms, we were asking them to self quarantine um, mm -hmm. at least for 14 days because we knew that if uh, they were going to develop symptoms. It would usually happen by 11.5 days. Um, and and uh, so that 14-day quarantine, self-quarantine, would help us identify if they had developed symptoms. And if they didn't, by the end of the 14-day self-quarantine, then the chances were that the viral, uh, they were no longer shedding viruses and were uh, less of a risk of infecting other people. So we kind of recognized it for some time based on the patterns of spread that we'd seen here in Washington state and in other states across the country that we were seeing viruses spread by people who didn't have symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, you know, just the cleaning and the hand sanitizer and those sorts of things that you can be doing as well to protect yourself is yeah. also just an important thing to highlight. I know you spoke about it a little bit. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, what steps should people be doing, you know, social distancing, but as we're re-entering life um, <laughs> and engaging with one another within the Safe Start program, you know, what are maybe three things that, you know, as an individual, you are making sure like, hey, th these are kind of some of the things I want to keep in mind every day. Yeah, that's, you know, I think that's a great question because sometimes, you know, we want it, we want to be able to, to start reliving or being able to kind of resume what we would be, what we would consider normal activity. And especially with the weather changing and, and well, maybe not today with some of the rain and, and overcast, but you know. Where did June go? <laughs> exactly, right? So. Isn't it January around here, I guess? No. Yeah. Well, somebody in my office told me that I, I could leave my rubber boots at home. I wouldn't need my rain boots anymore. And I thought, you know, I don't 
no, I think I'm going to keep holding on to them. And I'm glad <laughs> I did. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, but uh, I think that's a great question because what is the, what does it look like now as we go forward? So I, I think the three things that I would ask people to remember is that because viruses can spread from people who don't have symptoms, then you want to make sure that you're preventing the spread if you might actually have the virus. And you also want to be mindful that there are others out there who, who may not feel sick at the time who could spread the virus to you. So I think that's one of the reasons why I think the masks are a great idea. Um, they're a way of making sure that if you do have the virus and you're not aware of it, that you're protecting others from spreading it to them. And if you are close to people who are talking to you and they're wearing the mask or you've got your own mask on, then it also helps create a barrier for, for their viruses and that are less likely to infect you. And then it's a great reminder, it's a great visual reminder that not only should we be mindful about how we might still spread virus uh, particles, but it's a great reminder that we need to continue to wash our hands all the time. With every chance you get, wash your hands. And, and while you're standing there, if you think, if you have to think, when was the last time I washed my hands? Then that's probably a good sign to get some hand sanitizer on right away. You know, so get into that habit of continually, you know, washing your hands uh, on a frequent basis. And then finally, I think the other part that's so important is. Um, if you have somebody that works with you or works for you that is ill, then we, we, we want to remove the stigma of telling people, hey, it is okay to stay home. If you're not feeling well, it is okay to stay home. It's the best thing for everybody else in your, in your business or your company. It's the best thing for that individual. And so I think in that ex to that extent, um, business owners and employers want to make it as easy as possible for people to do the right thing because it, it'll help with not only the rest of your employees, but it also helps them with reassuring customers that you have a safe place for them to come into. Yeah. So in some of the businesses where social distancing is not quite as um, possible, I'd, I'd love to just hear your thoughts or, you know, if there have been conversations around what areas the state could maybe help support testing or PPE on an ongoing basis for those critical industries that, you know, might not be, you know, might have constant contact with people, you know, yeah. kind of aside from healthcare, um, you know, what is the governor or what is your team thinking about in, in regards to that? Yeah, uh, another great question because we recognize that there are certain businesses where you just cannot create those, you know, those, the space between individuals. And so uh, like in, uh, on, on an assembly line, looking at whether or not you can put um, dividers, clear dividers between individuals to help limit some of the spread or, or the contact that way. Um, and looking at that, you had a great question about um, public health and the local health jurisdictions. And so we're going to be working very closely with them going forward to figure out what are some of the more scalable ways that we can do testing? And how do we do that at the local health levels, at the, in the county levels? So a lot of our conversations going forward, especially as we're working with the Department of Health to identify the best way to do a statewide testing program really has to include the local health jurisdictions and, and how we're all working together with that. And it, it's the local health folks and the local health department that are also going to be kind of the first point of contact for the businesses within a county to get the information, to get the advice. And then in some cases, you know, as uh, counties are applying for waivers in the Safe Start program, they, they have to work very closely with the local health officers who will then verify or validate that how they've got things set up is going to be safe and doesn't contribute to the spread. So talk to me a little bit about antibody testing. Um, mm -hmm. What is the role for that right now um, as opposed to just testing for the virus itself? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> that wasn't too much of a softball question there. Uh, <laughs> nope. Our participants really, they're really thinking about, about this new world. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and I would love to see, I would love to see more extensive antibody testing. But having said that, the antibody testing, just to give everybody a little bit of background information, the antibody testing tells you whether or not you've been exposed to the virus. Um, antibodies occur in the body as a result of being infected by the virus. 
Um, and so we have some tests that do show antibodies to the coronavirus. The thing that we don't know about the antibody testing is we don't know how long ago you might have been exposed to the virus. So if you have the antibodies, you know, was it two weeks ago? Was it a month ago? Was it six months ago? We, we don't know the timing of that unless, unless you also happen to get tested when you were sick and you got a test that came back that says you are positive for the virus. And, and that's usually called the molecular testing where it actually tells you you've got the virus. Um, so that's one of the challenges with antibody testing. It doesn't tell you when you might have been exposed. The other thing that we don't know about antibody testing is we don't know how protective antibodies are. We can't say with a high degree of confidence that if you've got the antibodies that you are now protected against getting COVID-19 again. We just, we don't even know that. And if it does have a protective um, capability, we don't know how long that protection remains. And so those, and then finally, the last part, and this is really something that I feel um, is actually the most important part to me is that we haven't developed an antibody test that gives us a high level of, of um, confidence in the results. In other words, uh, there's still too many false positives and false negatives with antibody testing. So it runs the risk of giving you a false sense of security when you might not have the right antibodies to begin with. So we've not necessarily introduced that as part of our statewide testing program until we have a, a higher degree of confidence in the results. Um, and once we do have that, I think the challenge will be, how do you get it to scale really quickly? And how do you incorporate that into your overall testing strategy? Yeah, so if someone has had the virus, um, has been given a clean bill of health, you know, they've mm -hmm. quarantined for the appropriate time, no longer have symptoms, um, should people still be practicing social dis distancing and or quarantining? Or how should people go about after they have um, been diagnosed? Yeah, oh, I, I, that's another great question. And again, that's part of the mystery that we have here. Even though we have a lot of people that we know have been identified with the virus, um, surprisingly, for as much experience as we have had across the country, um, about 90% of our population has still not, is, is what we call virus naive. They're not, they've not been exposed to it or we don't have a record of them being tested for it. And so we have to assume they're still at risk for getting the, the virus. Um, people who have had the virus and have recovered, you know, you've probably heard of some very famous ones who have been asked to donate some of their plasma to see if we can get more information from that. But we don't even know that if they've had the virus and they recovered, if they still can't transmit it again. Here's the important thing about the coronavirus. It is, the, it is from the same family as the common cold. And I think most people know that you can have the cold more than once. And it changes a little bit. <laughs> yes, yes. And so, you know, if you think about it from that perspective, then I think we have to assume that this coronavirus, this COVID-19 is something that you can catch again. And so even though you've had it and you recovered, you still want to take precautions that you don't either get it again or that you inadvertently spread it to others if you again develop a high viral titer without getting the symptoms. So I, I think you want to continue to practice the safe distancing, the hand washing and the masking. So let's talk a little bit about contact tracing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a, several questions around this. Um, Talk to us about some of the innovative ways you'd recommend that businesses promote contact tracing and can help in that process. Yeah. So contact tracing is such an important part because uh, when we do contact tracing correctly, we know that we can identify a group of people and protect them and others very, very, you know, very early in the whole process. And I'll give you as an example, um, in Kittitas about, I want to say it was like three weeks ago, uh, at one of the food processing plants, we identified somebody who was positive for COVID-19. 
And we did some contact tracing almost immediately, which is the best time to do this. And we found out that there were about 170 additional people who had been potentially exposed and might come down with COVID-19. Um, and when we looked at those 170 people, we were also able to determine that about half of them lived in Kittitas and the other half had come from Yakima County. And that's important because now you can start saying, okay, for each of those people who were potentially exposed, you know, what are their living situations? Mm -hmm. Do they live close enough to others where they could potentially impact them? Do they have, do they live with elderly people or people who have other con medical conditions that may, might make them at more risk? I mean, what is our chance for spreading? So with those 170 people, what we were able to do is say, hey, we recommend that if you don't have symptoms, then just kind of self quarantine for a while. If you do have symptoms, let's get you tested and let's make sure that your disease or your symptoms don't progress. And so being able to do that, like within days of identifying was so helpful because the other piece that we were able to do is we were able to look at the hospital system at both, in both Kittitas and Yakima and make sure that they had enough room in the, in the hospitals and that they had enough ventilators if those patients or if those individuals had become more symptomatic and would eventually need hospitalization or if they might even need a ventilator. So contact tracing is extremely important in terms of helping us get, in, get as far upstream as possible and identify as many people as we can uh, before they actually develop symptoms. Um, one of the things that I saw with uh, some of the restaurant owners that I think was, is so helpful and if this, should, if this should occur, then they're in a great position. But what they did is they asked some of their, um, their clients, their customers who were coming back, uh, if they wouldn't mind participating in, in signing a sheet or letting people know that they were in the restaurant that day. And if for some reason somebody uh, came back positive, then they'd be able to let them know that there was that there's a potential exposure. Uh, but it also would give public health an opportunity to say, okay, well, how many people were in the restaurant at that time when somebody became positive? And, you know, we've been looking at ways that we can do this in a de-identified way so people don't feel like, you know, that we're checking on their every move. But as I just described, being able to do that contact tracing as quickly as possible goes a long way to controlling and containing the spread of the disease. So I've seen businesses who have voluntarily asked their customers to, to sign up and let, let know. Uh, you know, Apple and Google have been uh, looking at ways that electronically you can opt into a service that uh, allows you to get notified if you happen to be in an area where somebody eventually came back positive. And I think that's, that's probably something that we would want to encourage, um, you know, if it becomes a service that's available and people can opt in. Uh, I would hope that people would prefer knowing versus mm -hmm. not knowing. So I think those are a couple of ways that people might want to think about. Are there other technology-based solutions that you're aware of? I know Apple and Google you mentioned, but are there other ones that um, you know employers could look at even in their, their own employment situations? Um, love to, to hear what you know on that. So the only other examples that I have come from other countries. And, um, and so uh, in the international community, they really took the contact tracing to a very high level and to the point where they're using closed, you know, CCTV, closed circuit television. Mm -hmm. They're also looking at um, uh, credit card spending, you know, so like if they happen to see at a particular business venue that somebody became ill with COVID-19, then what they would do is they would screen the business for other credit cards that had been used and then go about notifying them that there was a potential exposure to COVID-19. Um, all of those are probably a little bit more advanced than what we do here in the United States. And so, um, but I do think that there might have something there that we might wanna try and see, is there a way of doing this easily uh, that is you know, digitally based but also preserves the, the privacy of people. So mm -hmm. I think we can look at other countries to see how they, they're doing it. Um, the other thing that uh, places like Singapore and South Korea have done is they have actually active tracers, which is very labor intensive. And we are, we're doing a combination. I mean, we're doing a lot of that here in, in 
Washington State, but we recognize that keeping a high number or um, an adequate number of tracers is going to be pretty challenging in order for us to do this across um, a broad number of people. Yeah, well, it's, you know, what I love about the kind of Seattle, greater Seattle area is the innovation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think if there's any place that could help figure out some of these things from a technology <laughs> point and how to make it, you know, de-identified and, and safe for people to feel comfortable. Um, I, I, I think it's the business community in our state. So hopefully someone listening has some ideas that they can, can bring to the table. Um, so just the la a last question before we wrap up here. Um, do you have any advice for business owners, individuals on how to encourage wearing masks and keeping social distancing when we see, um, you know, some of our leaders not doing that. So when we're seeing public, you know, either political leaders or movie stars or other public figures not doing that, how do we kind of start to break that, yeah. that um, image there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you have people like me that, that go to them and remind them that we really could use their help mm -hmm. in setting the example. And, and actually, you know, sometimes it kind of surprises me when I see the media shots and I think, oh, you know, that would have been a great opportunity to wear a mask and, and show everybody that it's, it's doable and it's the right thing to do. So I think it's really just a lot of communication and messaging and making sure that people understand the importance of this. Uh, it's, it's something that it's an adjustment. Uh, mm -hmm. People are not accustomed to, to wearing masks to begin with, unless you're somebody like me who wore it on a regular basis in the operating room or when I was in the, in the ICU taking care of certain patients. So it is, it is an adjustment. But I think that especially here in Washington state where the community that right from the very start when the governor asked me to come here back in March, one of the first things I noticed about Washington state is how engaged everybody is. Mm -hmm. You know, the businesses, the, you know, the citizens, the private citizens, everyone was so engaged. I mean, I was, I thought, man, if anyone's going to do it, it's going to be Washington state because people were engaged. So I think that those same people who were engaged from the very beginning, if they can help us communicate and message the importance of doing this, um, it'll preserve everyone's flexibility. It'll preserve everyone's ability to get back out there. If we can be a part of making sure it doesn't spread. Um, and right now our best tools until we have a vaccine or until we have medication that can effectively treat this, the best treatment is prevention. And right now the tools we have have been proven to work when we had to stay home, stay healthy. And now as we're doing the safe start, we know that the masks are a very big part of that. So I would ask the, the leadership in the community, the community members, the private citizens who have been engaged from the very beginning um, to continue to help us with that. And, um, and, you know, my own interaction and my role in the various parts of the community, whether it's at the state or the local uh, government level is to, is to be able to remind, remind people and, and encourage them to help set that example. Yeah, I think leading by example is probably one of the easiest and, and hardest, but easiest ways that we can encourage people. Um, I know my husband and I walked with our kiddos, um, you know, down to, to pick up some takeout a couple of weeks ago. And we noticed that not many people were wearing masks. And, yeah. you know, we were completely socially distant. But I was like, you know what, kids, it, we're going to wear our masks. Um, and someone actually commented, they said, Oh, well, if a three-year-old can wear a mask, I guess I probably should. I was like, yes, a three-year-old can wear a mask. A five-year-old can wear a mask. Um, exactly. And, exactly. You know, I know for our family, we've been since the beginning trying to, um, you know, make it a little fun mm -hmm. <laughs> at the house. So sometimes they're even wearing masks in the house as Batman or whatever. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think just even from that perspective, finding ways to normalize it. A little yes. bit more and um, helping set ourselves up a bit as well of making sure I have an extra one in the car or yeah yeah because I have found myself running into Safeway and then be like oh. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah yeah so and, and that you know that was another suggestion he actually reminded me of something else I meant to share earlier is that sometimes what what I have found helpful are those businesses where they either offer hand sanitizer or masks as you come in 
Yeah. And I think that's a great reminder too, and it's a great way to support that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I did put in the chat panel a resource, so businesshealthtrust.com backslash supplies. Um, we, in partnership with the chamber, have been putting together resources for folks so that they can get the supplies that they need for reopening. Um, and then just also letting folks know that we are working closely with the various counties across the state to try to get more PPE as we enter new phases. Yeah of things um, as the counties are able to leverage their purchasing power. So we will try and communicate um, as those things develop. So thank you so very much for your time. Um, it's That's very true. clear to me, and I think someone put this in the chat box too, of it, it, it's clear why the governor chose you to help lead this <laughs> effort. Um, you're, you're the person that I would want <laughs> to do this as well. So I feel more informed and, and very much appreciate your time today. So thank you very much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. and I appreciate your interest and in, in really um, I think as the business community you're right if there's anybody who can figure it out it's it's the Seattle business uh, community you've got all the right types of talent and thinking there and so um, it's been a real pleasure to partner with you today but also in the future because I think that you are the ones that are going to help us find the solution so thank you very much yes absolutely um, thank you everyone for joining us today. I do want to let everyone know we have two additional webinars coming up this week. One is tomorrow, uh, June 10th, that will feature Rachel Smith, who has joined us in the past. She is the Deputy Executive for King County. So she's going to be talking more about Phase 1.5 um, and what that means for businesses and customers. And on Thursday, June 11th, um, we will have a webinar on cybersecurity. We've heard a lot about fraud and phishing attacks. So we will be talking with a panel um, that can help your business equip, be equipped to continue to work remotely and protect both your employees and your customers. So you can register for both of those on the uh, Seattle Metropolitan Chamber website. Thank you all and have a fantastic day.